Hey, Waypoint Overland, how you doing? Good to see you. It's been, uh, what, what's the last time we saw each other was, uh, where were we? Overland Expo. Overland Expo East. Man, that's a long time ago. So, good to see you. This is Ronnie Dahl. I'm at Overland West, all the way from Australia, Perth, Australia, all the way here. 30 hours to get here. Awesome place. And I'm here with Waypoint Overland. Cheers, guys. Hey guys, Justin here from Patriot Campers. I'm hanging out here at Overland Expo West with Waypoint Overland. Roland, we're at Rebranch, Ash, outside of Asheville, North Carolina, the Overland Expo East, and this is Waypoint Overland TV. Hey you guys, welcome to Overland Expo East and welcome to Waypoint uh, Overland TV. We're having a great time here. Outfit and explore, you guys. Hey guys, this is Jason with the Primal Outdoors channel and I'm at Northwest Overland Rally and you're watching Waypoint TV. Hey, this is Lifestyle Overland. We're here at Expo East over in Arlington, Virginia. Come out and see Expo. We've got all kinds of amazing stuff and right now we're watching Waypoint Overland. Hi guys, I'm Jason Specht with Mountain State Overland and you are watching Waypoint Overland TV. What's up, this is Brandon from Trailspin TV and I'm hanging out with Waypoint Overland TV. Welcome to Expo West. Sponsored by Midland. Communication for every adventure. The industry leader in radio communication technology and innovation for over 50 years. Always remember, the opinion you follow should be your own. Just consider the things stated here to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Hi, my name is Phil from Waypoint Overland, and you're listening to Random Waypoints. All right, so here we go. Welcome to the second episode of the Random Waypoints podcast. We'll be doing an episode every week. So subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell to make sure you don't miss an episode. Later in the show, we're going to be doing taste tests, looking at some gear, and talking communications for the Overland Traveler. So stay tuned for the whole show. But first, let's look at the news. During this segment, we'll cover various topics with a connection to overlanding in some way. It could be land use news regarding the national parks or the Bureau of Land Management. We'll keep you up to date on any auto industry news when it pertains to relevant and potential overlanding vehicles. There will be camping and outdoor industry news, as well as photography and video, fishing, hiking, and on and on. Now, here's the news. As an associate member of the Red Rock Four Wheelers, I feel compelled to straighten out all the misinformation out there on whether there is or isn't going to be an Easter Jeep Safari this year. The simple answer is yes, there will be an Easter Jeep Safari this year. The Grand County Administrator has assured the president of the Red Rock Four Wheelers that the county ordinance that was hindering the Easter Jeep Safari event would be amended by the 16th of this month, February, which would allow the event to proceed. I think that sums it up, and there shouldn't be no more confusion about it now. For those interested or curious, an associate membership is for individuals and families whose permanent residence is outside of Grand County, San Juan County, or the city of Green River, Utah. As an associate member of Red Rock Four Wheelers, 90% of dues go into the MUD Fund, which stands for Multiple Use Defense and assists in keeping roads open for public use, which is an ever, ever increasing challenge. Donations are annually given by the club to local groups such as the Search and Rescue, Moab City Police, and both Grand and San Juan County Sheriff's Offices, and nationally such as United Four Wheel Drive Associations, Tread Lightly, and the Blue Ribbon Coalition. There's also several perks for being a member, like monthly club rides, a quarterly newsletter, and special club events and activities throughout the year. I want to talk about Canada now. Now, 
this may not seem like Overland news at first, but please just bear with me and you'll see. Canada has decided to block cruise ships for a year. Hmm. The ban is through February 22, which is expected to block many ships from visiting Alaska this year. Most large cruise ships that visit Alaska each year are registered to foreign countries, and U.S. federal law prohibits foreign registered ships from sailing between two American ports without stopping at a foreign port foreign port in between. So large cruise ships bound for Alaska, they either begin their voyages in Canada or they stop there on the way. Only a handful of smaller ships fly a U.S. flag and don't need to visit a foreign port to satisfy the law. Now, two years ago, which is before the world changed, Alaska recorded 1.3 million visitors from cruise ships. Their passengers visiting Alaska disembarked the cruise ships to go on an outdoor excursion to places like uh, Anchorage, Denali National Park, and Fairbanks. Okay, so how does this have anything to do with overlanding? Well, as an overlander, I see a unique opportunity. Currently, the land borders between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, they remain closed until at least February 21st. But if the Canadian-U.S. border is open later this year, even if it just allows passage through the country, it could make an overland-based trip to Alaska this year a very shrewd move. The biggest complaint I hear over and over again from overlanders who visit Alaska is that you, you really want to visit all the cool ports and towns you heard and read about, but the huge crowds that visit from the cruise ships makes it a nightmare. They usually tell me it's the only negative experience they had when visiting Alaska. Well, you won't be complaining about crowds at the big port towns this year. My prediction is most anything you want to do in Alaska It'll be enhanced. With over a million less people visiting the state, I can't think of a better time to visit. Hmm. What do you think? In national park news, all U.S. national parks are now enforcing masks following an executive order that recently went into effect. Wearing masks has shifted from a guideline to law. Face masks are now required in U.S. national parks. When visitors can't maintain physical distance and in all national parks, uh, national park service buildings. Zion National Park's chief law enforcement ranger stated, before we could say, please put on a mask. And if someone says, I don't want to, we couldn't force it or enforce it. But now, with it being a law, we can take enforcement action. Now look. I don't care at all what your position is on this subject. This is merely to inform you that if you want to visit a national park, a mask is required. Always remember, the opinion you follow should be your own. In auto industry news, electric vehicle upstart Rivian so far has only taken orders online for their vehicles. But they've announced future openings of no less than 10 showrooms this year. This will give potential customers a physical location to experience his vehicles up close. Rivian has decided not to call locations showrooms. And according to Automotive News, the manufacturer sees them more as retail experiences, which gives me the impression they won't have the usual test drives there. So far, Rivian has announced showroom openings in Chicago, Laguna Beach, and Los Angeles. Rivian is set to deliver its very first vehicles in June of this year. First to reach customers will be the R1T pickup, and the R1S SUV is scheduled to start being delivered in late August. Rivian's manufacturing facility is in Normal, Illinois, and their battery technology facilities are in Irvine, California. The R1T will start at 67.5, and the R17 at 70,000 with the 130 kilowatt large pack affording 300 miles of range and 180 watt max pack, which adds 10,000 to the price of either vehicle and boosts the range up to 400 miles. Lower price versions uh, with a smaller battery pack will likely arrive later. 
My personal introduction to Rivian was their debut in Flagstaff, Arizona at Overland Expo in 2019. I interviewed them. If they make a vehicle half as good as the sales pitch, it's going to be an interesting future for overlanding. I'd like to know if these vehicles interest you for overlanding. And a side note, um, the first Rivian vehicles to actually make it to the road and be used for their intended purposes are the delivery vans that were built for global retail giant Amazon. The company plans to set up 41 service locations, which together with mobile service and over-the-air updates will handle maintenance and repairs for owners of the R1T and the R1S, as well as for Rivian's Amazon delivery van. Now it's time for Random Lists. Random Lists is all about lists Waypoint Overland has created on an array of topics, such as top five national parks, top 10 trails in the United States, top 10 fill in the blank. I think you get it. Some lists will be pure fun and others very informational, but they all will have a connection to overlanding in some way. We're very interested in hearing your suggestions for upcoming lists in the comments. Now, here's our random list. Okay, this is my top 10 overland routes in the US. Now, as you dissect and critique my list, please remember, this is a list for an overlander as opposed to an off-roader. So at number one, I have the Dalton Highway in Alaska. Now, if you're here listening to me, it's highly likely you've heard of the Dalton Highway. This mostly gravel road in North, northern Alaska stretches 414 miles from Living Good to Dead Horse. It was originally built as a service road for the pipeline and is still considered one of the most dangerous roads in the U.S. But that's mainly because there's a lack of services and cell phones uh, reception. But you get a big payoff for heading in this direction. There's opportunities to see some of the most spectacular wilderness in the country, traversing the Brooks Range and crossing the Yukon River en route to the Arctic Ocean. Side note here. If you're heading to Alaska, a bonus is to take the Dempster Highway through the Yukon and Northwest Territories of Canada. The Dempster Highway is a bucket list trail in itself. So it's 465 miles point to point. And it's mainly non-technical, uh, gravel, dirt, but you need to plan well due to the long distances between fuel stops. It ends just shy of the Arctic Ocean in Inuvik, Northwest Territories, and is the gateway to an otherwise untouched swath of mountainous tundra. Drive it, and you'll cross the continental divide three times, the Arctic Circle, and two mountain ranges. Now, let's go back to our list. At number two, I have the Alpine Loop Scenic Byway. Um, the Alpine Loop starts in Silverton, Colorado, and it's uh, 63 miles through the heart of the San Juan Mountains, nestled between the highways of uh, 550 and State Route 149. The route is closed during the winter, and the high alpine environments of Engineer and Cinnamon Passes, which are both over 200 feet, require a high-clearance four-wheel drive vehicle. The entire loop takes about four to six hours, and you'll pass abandoned mining towns along the way, and along with plenty of opportunities for hiking and camping. There are more challenging routes in the area, like the Black Bear Pass, but if you're looking for a mid-length, overland route with spectacular mountain views in the Rockies, this is your trail. At number three, we have the Mojave Road in the Mojave National Preserve. It's 138 miles point to point, and it'll take you two to five days you follow the historic route that was used first by native people and later by westward bound settlers. It bisects the Mojave National Preserve in California's southeastern desert. And unlike many other legacy trade routes, the Mojave Road was never paved over. So a trip here is a trip back in time. While the road is mostly non-technical, there's a couple of areas along the route where people do get into trouble and you should have a vehicle that's outfitted with skid plates for the rougher sections of the road to be safe. To avoid the extreme temperatures in summer and winter, 
plan for spring or fall. If you're not familiar with the terrain, check with park officials for current conditions. And keep an eye on the weather as monsoons can quickly turn normally dry lakes into impassable mud bogs. Having a satellite communicator like a Garmin inReach or a Midland Micro Mobile Radio is a good idea on this route too. Not just for the communication, but also for weather forecasts and alerts. At number four, I have the White Rim Road in Canyonlands National Park. Now this classic route explores Canyonlands National Parks in the stunning island in the Sky District which is an otherworldly landscape carved by three rivers. You have to the east, the mighty Colorado River. To the west, there's the Snake and Green River. And to the south is their confluence. It's only moderately difficult, and I recommend doing it in a high-clearance vehicle equipped with true low-range gearing, a big help when descending some of the steeper sections of the trail. And please grab an overnight permit from Park Service and break the route into as many as four days. More days means more opportunities to camp in some of the 10 incredible campgrounds that line the 110 mile road. But please keep an eye on the weather. Parts of the White Rim become impassable when wet. Now at number five, I have the Trans America Trail. It goes from Tennessee to Oregon. Now, First of all, there's not many 5,000 mile routes on the planet, let alone one that's 92% dirt roads. The Trans-America Trail crosses the entire U.S. from Virginia all the way to Oregon on dirt roads and two track. It's the rare route you can still drive coast to coast almost entirely off pavement. It was originally pieced together by dual sport motorcycle riders, but it can be done in a four wheel just as well. With several variations and spurs to choose from, the route skirts or takes you straight through some of the country's most beautiful gems, including the Great Smoky Mountain National Park, Great Sand Dunes National Park, Arches National Park, and Yellowstone National Park. But the route's biggest charms are in all the in-between areas. Uh, The large, empty, winding roads through rural countrysides and lush forests. Now, everyone I know has had navigation issues with this one. So I advise having paper maps and several different GPX files to ensure you not only stay on the route, but have options if something comes up. At number six, I have the Trans-Wisconsin Adventure Trail. The overland version of the Trans-Wisconsin Trail has become increasingly popular in the last couple of years. It was originally designed for dual sport and adventure bikes. The route is 600 to 630 miles long and consists of paved roads, gravel roads, and dirt and sand forest roads. The route starts on the Wisconsin-Illinois border just north of Galena, Illinois, and ends at Lake Superior near the town of Cornucopia. It's approximately 50% pavement, 40% gravel roads, and 10% dirt sand forest roads. It works its way north via scenic back roads to the Lake Superior shore. In the south portion, principally uses winding and rolling paved roads that take in some of the outstanding scenery along the Mississippi River and the Driftless region in southwest Wisconsin. And as you work your way north, you'll find yourself on mostly gravel and dirt roads and paths that guide you through the wondrous sights and scenes of the northern forest. The route is on all public roads, So any street legal vehicle is an option to do this. You do need a vehicle that has decent ground clearance, but four wheel drive isn't usually needed. Uh, Although it's handy, it's a really nice scenic drive with a lot of options to keep you and your passengers entertained. Next at number seven, I have the Colorado backcountry discovery route. Now, if getting high is your thing, Colorado offers some of the tallest mountains passable by motorized vehicles in the U.S. Several passes are over 12,000 feet and beginning in the Four Corners location where Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah intersect, this route winds its way north through the Rocky Mountains to the Wyoming border. The terrain includes dirt roads with rocks, sand, and even a few water crossings to keep it exciting. The route is designed to be ridden on adventure and dual sport bikes, but this one also can be driven by 4x4 vehicles. 
And many of the roads are in remote, remote areas and reach high elevation areas where road maintenance is minimal or non-existence. So you can expect to cover sections of road with deep ruts, loose rocks, sand, and other challenges. There's also sections that have deep sand. Road conditions change from week to week, week to week based on recent weather. When you see signs that read roads may be impassable when wet, please use caution. You may also encounter sections that have trees or branches over the road, but there are alternate easier routes around a few of the most cha challenging sections. Depending on the time of year and weather, there may be a few small deep water crossings. Flash floods are frequent during summer storms. Don't cross flooded washes. Wait until the water subsides. The best time of year for this is July through September. Most of the route can be done in late June. And depending on the snowpack, you might not make it through some high passes until sometime in July. At number eight, I have the Idaho Backcountry Discovery Route. Now, if you ever want to ride an endless, twisty, mountainous road, the Idaho BDR will throw cor corners at you for days on end. It's a true off-the-grid ride at 1,250 miles long. Starting in the historic town of Jarbridge, Nevada, the route crosses rangelands and then heads into the Boise National Forest and treats you to views of Anderson Reservoir and epic alpine camping at Trinity Lakes, tiny towns and treasures like Bergdorf Hot Springs make this a bucket list for sure. You'll travel where Lewis and Clark made history and experience the legendary Magruder Corridor and Lolo Motorway, which skirt the roadless Selway Bitterroot Wilderness. You'll reach modest hints of civilization as you pass through Sand Point and Bonnie's Ferry on your way to the Canadian border. I think the best time of year is July through October for this. Late June can be nice if the snow hasn't melt if the snow has melted from the high passes, and you need to watch out for early snow and hunters if you're going in the fall. I have it number nine, Smoky Mountain Highway. Now, it's not technical, but you are remote enough on this 78 mile dirt road from Page, Arizona to Escalante, Utah that you need to come prepared. With that said, with a full tank of fuel and a fuel full-size spare, a stock 4x4 can navigate this route through the heart of the Grand Staircase National Monument in about six hours. But the plentiful dispersed camping along the way will keep you there longer, most likely. This is another place I recommend to bring along a satellite communicator. Now, at number 10, we have the Washington Backcountry Discovery Route. Now, this 575-mile route, it thoroughly explores the Cascade Mountains, beginning in Stevenson, Washington, at the Bridge of the Gods, and making it to the Canadian border at Nighthawk. Views of the massive volcanic mountains from the dense forest in the southern part of the route are stunning, and the open arid pine forest of the central part of the route it showcases the diversity of Washington. The route just seems to get better and better each day as you head north into the high mountain areas beyond Lake Chelan. It takes most people about five to seven days to complete the route. And there are some easy alternate sections to get around the difficult stretch, stretches. There are many great camp spots along the way for those looking to rough it. And the route also works well for those looking to stay in hotels or to do a little bit of both. I think the best time of year is June to September. Uh, snow in the mountain passes can block riders from completing the route early and late in the season. So that's why I say that. And that's pretty standard. Well, that's my list. What do you think? Share your list. Let's talk about it. Now, I haven't eaten today. I'm hungry. And that makes this the perfect time to introduce our new segment called Taste Test. Taste Tests. Taste Test is where we evaluate the taste of a food product, whether on its own or compared with other products. Some taste tests will be conducted blind, while others will focus on a particular brand or item. 
I was watching a video of a couple overlanding on YouTube and they were on a remote trail for several days. And as they were heading back to civilization, they showed an amazing campsite. They really wanted to stay at it for a few days, but they needed to go to the grocery store. And that was the end of that. That's why I always stock my dry goods box with all types of stuff, just in case of an emergency, but also so I don't miss out on special moments. That's why we're out there, right? I try to find things that, can, that I can store but taste good enough to be eaten even when it's not an emergency. Some of the things I bring are from Patagonia Provisions. They have an online shop with pantry-friendly foods like organic berry bars, soups, chilies, jerky, drinks, seeds, and they have all kinds of delicious bundles of smoked mackerel, salmon, and mussels. The packs are perfect for camping and hiking, but can also be used as a full-fledged dinner when you're exhausted or running low on groceries. Some of my favorites are all the smoked mussels. They have three different types, and I also love the smoked mackerel. If I need a quick snack, I like the fruit and almond bars. Trust me, they're delicious. And if you need something warm in your stomach, I recommend their soups and their chilies. Okay, let's taste all this stuff. All right, so we're going to start with the lemon herb mussels first. Um, these are, if you're not used to mussels, these are probably the safest for you. I'm hungry. I don't feel like talking. I'm about to get right into one. Delicious. I'm not surprised to eat them all the time. I'm supposed to be talking right now, but I'd rather eat a few of them first. Because I didn't eat all day just for this. Now, if I was going to describe the taste, I would say it has like a, a clean, bright, fresh taste of the, of the sea. Like I said before, these are going to be the safest ones if mussels are something questionable to you. So now let's move on to the next one. We're going to try another mussel. All right, next up, we're trying the smoked mussels. The smoked mussels are smoked over Spanish bay wood and packed in organic olive oil and mussel broth. Here we go. They have a, a savory taste of the sea. That's the best way to describe it because of the smoke taste in it. Now, if you had smoked mussels before, they're going to taste a little different, not because something's wrong, but because the ones that come in the can are not made with the quality that these are made. So when you try them, you're going to immediately be like, wow. And I want another one. So after I eat this one, we're going to move on to the next one, which is my favorite. And uh, I'm going to give you a, a tip on how to, how to eat them. All right, and now my favorite, which are the savory sofrito mussels. I made these last because if I had started with these, I would have just ate the whole can, or I would have at least wanted to eat the whole can. So I made them last. Now that I've eaten a few of the others, I, I might be okay. Now these are seasoned and packed in organic mussel broth, organic real red bell peppers, organic olive oil, organic onion, organic sherry wine, organic spinach, and organic spices. And I, I don't want to forget the tip I was going to give you, but if you have any kind of pasta when you're when you're out overlanding, spaghetti, noodles, any kind of pasta. It can even be ravioli as long as it doesn't have any, it's not like a meaty type. It can be like a cheese one. Anyway, if you have some, some kind of pasta, you just add these at the end and you've got an awesome meal. These are delicious. So let me try them. Mm. 
These are so good. Now these, not only do I keep them in my rig, but I keep them in the house. These go go in the house. Um, the, the the fruit bars and the seeds, I usually keep those like in my office too. So these are like great snacks when I'm watching TV or just want a snack. I highly recommend these. These are my number one. I love these. I even like grabbing up the little bits of vegetables and eating those too. But I'm actually delaying this because I want to eat all of this. But let's move on. All right, so here we go. We're going to start with the red bean chili. And just so you know, they also have spicy if you want even more flavor. And just so you know, <clears throat> it has pre-cooked red beans, organic, organic pre-cooked pinto beans. They're all organic, so let me just run them down. Tomatoes, diced tomatoes, ground red chilies, carrots, red bell peppers, salt, ground rice, ground cumin, garlic, organic chili peppers, and yeast extract. So again, nothing but organic stuff. No crazy stuff in here. So this is going to be great. So what you do is, now normally, you don't want to do it this way, but for the podcast, we're doing it this way, which is to pour the water. You have to pour two cups of water in. And we're going to wait 10 minutes. And I'll be back in a second. I'm going to clean this up real quick and seal that off. And um, we're going to taste it in 10 minutes. Okay, so we're back. And we're about to try the red bean chili. And like I've said before about everything else, I've had this before. I already know it's delicious. But for the taste test, here we go. Now, there's no meat in it, so remember that when I make the statement I'm about to make. Reminds you of home-cooked chili. It only took me 10 minutes. Fresh vegetables. Oh, I shouldn't say fresh vegetables, but organic vegetables. Some people might want a little salt, but that's a good thing. It's low in sodium, so it's up to you whether or not you're going to, you know, bring up the sodium levels. Um, this is another thing that goes good over, over, uh, pasta. I like to put it over, uh, what do you call it? Skinny or thin spaghetti. And it's a whole meal. So <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to be doing a lot of taste tests cause I'm enjoying myself. I hope you are too. Cause this is delicious. <laughs> okay, um, enough of this. Like I said, it's delicious. Tastes like home cooked chili without meat and low in sodium. Uh, we're gonna go on to the next one. I've already added the water and um, it should be a couple of more minutes and we'll be right back. All right, so I'm back and We've got the black bean soup, and it's going to be delicious. The thing about this is I use this for a lot of different things. I eat it by itself, but I also like to put it over rice. I like to add um, kibasa to it. Um, it's a, whatever kind of meat you like. Add it to this and it'll be delicious. Trust me. You can even add fish to it. I've added um, catfish to it. I didn't fry the catfish. I baked it. Um, and then I wrapped it up in foil and, and brought it with me. And then I just broke it up in here and it was really good. But it's up to you what you do. 
Anyway, it's time to try this. It's delicious. The only thing I want to tell you is, is the same thing I told you about the last one. You may need salt, but if you're trying to reduce your salt, you're looking for things with low sodium, this is it. If it's, if it, if it, if it's lacking some flavor to you, it's probably the salt you're looking for, a sprinkle of salt, and you're in business. Um, or if you're trying to eliminate the the salt, but you still feel like you want to add some flavor to it, some hot sauce or some Tabasco sauce. But I like it just like it is. I'm trying. I'm trying to reduce my sodium. So that's that. I hope you like taste tests. And now it's time to move on to our next segment. Okay, now I want to discuss communications. Sponsored by Midland. Communication for every adventure. The industry leader in radio communication technology and innovation for over 50 years. First, a bit of trivia for you. Do you know what the four types of communication are? There's verbal communication, nonverbal communication, written communication, and visual communication. My philosophy on communication is simple. I want to stay connected. I want to hear you clearly, and it has to be uncomplicated. Now, I recommend these three things as your basic forms of communication when you're out there overlanding. I think you should have a satellite communicator, a GMRS radio, and a cell phone. We're going to focus on GMRS radios today, and more specifically, Midland Micro Mobile GMRS radios. Most of you are already aware of Midland two-way radios. They're reliable, versatile, and a popular choice among overlanders, off-roaders, farmers, just to name a few. Jeep Jamboree even made it their official communication after many years of CBs being the requirement. And the list grows as many events and groups make the same transition. So I expect soon that a GMRS radio will become the more common communication in most people's rigs. Some of the reasons why I think you need one are simple. One, more power. The FCC allows up to 50 watts of power on the GMRS frequency. Unlike traditional CB radios, which are limited by law to a maximum of four watts of power. So without this power restriction, micro mobiles come in at five, 15 and 40 watt radios. If you're gonna spend the money on a radio, it just makes sense to choose the GMR, GMRS radio over the CB. As the higher power of the GMRS radio works that much better. My second reason is FRS and GMRS are compatible. CBs are only compatible with other CBs. And this is a huge thing for me. I'm often part of impromptu last minute trips with others. So if someone in the group doesn't have a micro mobile, I just hand them a walkie talkie and roll out. Pretty much any walkie talkie you would find in a recreation store or an electronic store are going to be FRS, GMRS walkie talkies. The combo of a walkie talkie and a micro mobile together works well for spotting and recovery on the trail for overlanders or just to back your rig up into the perfect spot at camp. Another reason to get one is the better sound quality. Now, this is the most important thing to me. I was always frustrated with using CBs on trips. No matter what, someone sounds garbled and inevitably you end up asking someone to repeat messages over and over again. GMRS frequencies have better sound quality than CB frequencies, period. 
GMRS operates in the UHF band and is FM, which means you'll get higher quality sound with less static. GMRS radios require you to pay just $70 for a 10-year license from the FCC, which covers yourself and your household. Also, unlike ham radio licenses, there's no studying or tests required. You can apply by going online to the FCC website by following the link in the description below. My next reason is repeater channels. You can greatly extend the range of your GMRS radio with GMRS repeaters, similar to ham repeaters. Your micro mobile's operating range is extended even further in rugged, obstructed terrain. And when you purchase a Midland micro mobile, it's simple to use. They come ready to use. There's no programming or tuning required. It has a detachable flip frame bracket that lets you choose how to mount your radio on or under the dash. Plus, the quick release tabs make it even easier to transfer the unit from one rig to another or place out of sight to pre prevent theft. The micro mobiles run on 15 GMRS channels. That's one through seven and 15 through 22. Just turn to the channel you want to transmit on and start communicating. Also, Midland Micro Mobiles feature their signature National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration weather alert and weather scan technology. Severe weather can happen anytime, anywhere, and early warnings are your best protection, which is why the full range of radios that Midland carries has NOAA weather alert radio. These micro mobiles also include 10 NOAA weather channels, so you can easily scan for the forecast. Micro mobiles are significantly smaller than the conventional CB radio. This makes it easy for them to be mounted when space is limited, like in Jeeps, Toyotas, tractors, and combines. And besides an overall compact size, the MXT275 is a full 15 watts and has a fully integrated handheld microphone with everything you need to operate it right there, which is perfect for those with even less space. Mine is located between the seat and console of my rig. The only thing visible is the microphone. It comes with a mounting bracket, 12 volt power cord, DC adapter, detachable antenna, and a magnetic antenna mount included. You have everything to immediately get up and running. Nothing additional is required. However, there's lots of accessories. Now, my choice for handhelds would be the X-Talker T71 VP3 two-way radio. The number one reason why I chose this radio is I can charge it anywhere with a USB cable. And it has real long, long battery life. I've never tested how long, but Midland says up to 15 hours. I charge mine through my USB in my rig, so I never experience a dead battery or even come close. Another standout feature for me is the 38 mile range. Although they have a more powerful 40 watt radio, I've never found myself needing the extra power and it'll, it will be fully compatible with whatever GMRS devices others have because it has all 36 channels and 121 private privacy codes. Also, it's a license-free FRS radio, so I can hand it to anyone to use. Again, the combo of a handheld and a micro mobile together is highly versatile. Now I want to talk about my first experiences with my Rad Rover 5 by Rad Power Bikes in Seattle. We talked last week about how over the past few years, electric bikes have been growing in popularity. The designs are doing a better job of meshing the electrical parts cleanly, weights are dropping, performance is rising, and best of all, prices are coming down. It's getting to the point now where it's pretty hard to tell between a bicycle and an e-bike. But then there's the e-bike I chose, the Rad Rover 5, which leaves no doubt about what it is. I recently posted a video about my first ever ride of my new e-bike, or, or any electric bike for that matter. And not only was I impressed, but I had a ball making the video. I've ridden it every day now. And for me, it blends rugged capabilities with comfort. With the 750 watt rear motor and four inch wide knobby tires riding on huge wheels, it stands out wherever you go. It has sturdy handling 
And even though I've been using it on very steep hills where I live mostly, as well as heavily using the throttle, I still have been averaging 26 miles per charge so far. Now, that'll be higher for most people who won't encounter so many steep hills or constantly use the throttle. So far, it's been perfect, and it's become obvious why they're the best-selling electric fat bike in North America. If you add a rear rack to load up your gear, you'll be ready for camping, fishing, backpacking, or whatever it is you do out there. It's a fun electric bike that makes you feel you can go anywhere. I want to get into the tech and design also, because I don't want to mislead you. This bike is big and it's heavy. It's 69 pounds, but you should expect that from an off-road electric bike. It has a hard tail frame built from 66 aluminum and includes an RST suspension fork with preload and a motion lockout. The four inch tires are Kinda juggernauts and include puncture resistant liners and a reflective stripe on the side walls, which helps with nighttime visibility since the bike is essentially matte black. It has 180 millimeter mechanical disc brakes, front and rear that slow things down and have good power. It also has an LCD panel up on the handlebars that displays data bits, including the speed information, odometer, tripometer, battery status, and motor outputs and watts. There's five levels of assist and no assist option that keeps the bike system online and tracking distance if you decide you want a serious workout by just using pedal power. And instead of a thumb throttle, the Rad, 5, Rad Rover 5 has a twist grip on the inside of the right handlebar like a moped. The grip is progressive, again, like a moped throttle. So you can precisely add any amount of power to the motor above what the preset assist level is adding to your pedaling power. There's an LED headlight and a rear LED tail light with a brake light. If the bike is powered on, the rear brake light activates, a feature every bike should have, in my opinion. It can also be set to blink, but still go solid when you hit the brakes. Rad says the battery is good for 800 charging cycles and between 25 and 45 miles of range, depending on your use. The battery is modular and rides in a carrier where a water bottle usually sits and can be quickly locked or unlocked. Extra batteries to extend your ride can be purchased. Now, as far as the riding experience, again, at a base of 69 pounds, it's big and heavy and built like a truck. It comes partially assembled, and it took me 40 minutes to complete the assembly with the tools they provided. And even though I have tools already, now I don't have to purchase additional tools to keep in my bike kit. I just added the front wheel, the fenders, the seat, connected the lights, and topped off the battery. That's it. Now, living in Washington, I guess it's not a shock, but... My first few rides so far have been in the rain, but that seems to be no issue for this bike. The hub motor is quiet with a little winding sound as you ride, and hitting 20 miles an hour on a flat surface is easy. When powering up hills, it takes little effort. You feel like you can go anywhere. I originally planned on giving a full review after 500 miles, but I'm averaging 25 miles a day, and I think that's too short a time. So I decided a thousand miles is more appropriate. But so far, I can say it's a fun toy. Adding this to my Overland trips is going to be something new and exciting for me. It's going to allow me to extend my journeys even further. It's easy to operate and understand. And I love the twist grip throttle that pours on the power whenever it's needed. And despite being a big bike, the Rad Rover 5 seat and bars are easily adjustable and I have no trouble riding it. Additionally, Rad Power Bikes offer numerous accessories to tailor it to your needs, whether it's commuting or even delivery work. I've become an instant e-bike convert after my first ride. My bike, the Rad Rover 5, has a retail price of $1,599 or $1,600. If you're not familiar with e-bikes, that is a very competitive price, especially for what you get out of the box. Now let's go over the pros and the cons. To me, the pros are, it's a go anywhere electric bike. It has a powerful motor, good battery range, 
a built-in brake light, and it's, it has a stable ride that inspires confidence. Now, it has cons, and the biggest one is it's big and heavy. Also, you're in for a serious workout if you run, run out of battery, but it can be done. Me, I have big plans for my bike, and most of those plans don't revolve around an electrical outlet. So I'm ordering a second battery, maybe even a third. And that's all I have to say so far about that. I'll be giving updates and announce group rides soon. Well, that wraps up another episode of the podcast. I hope you like, share, and subscribe. And with that, I just want to say to everybody, Everyone stay safe, tread lightly, and hopefully I'll see you here or on a trail soon. Sponsored by Midland, communication for every adventure. The industry leader in radio communication technology and innovation for over 50 years. You have been listening to Waypoint Overland's Random Waypoints. Like, subscribe, and stay tuned for more.